watching the x Plane and you're with engineer Joseph Sirol uh, from the Kenya Power. He's the managing director there. And I want to sample some of your questions that have been asking as you continue the conversation. And you begin with uh, someone who doesn't leave their name. He says that uh, in many areas in Nairobi, when you experience power outage due to tran transformer breakdown, customers are left in the dark of a number of days. As Kenya Power says, they are looking around from other regions if they might have a spare transformer. What is the situation of Kenya Power in terms of maintenance and support? And I think we can begin with that. Um, engineer because um, those concerns are not just in Nairobi. There are areas that power will go. Um, we, we actually have a story from Kisi, I think uh, late August, uh, that was talking about some 12 transformers had been stolen as of that time. Other areas will take so much time to locate a transformer. What is the challenge with Kenya Power to really uh, sort this out? Thank you so much, Sam. And it's very good you've raised the issue of um vandalism and uh, of transformers. That's actually one of the, our, our very biggest challenges. But again, let me possibly update the viewers that one of the things that has really, has really, comp or had really compounded that issue mm -hmm. was that there was a period of almost one year, some, where Kenya Power was unable to procure anything. And especially the most critical items, these are transformers. And, uh, and meters. Mm -hmm. You'd have a lot of litigation, people filing litigations, and at times, those cases could drag for over a year. And in, during the entire period, of course, Kenya Power would be barred from procuring these items. But I want to assure the mm -hmm. listeners today mm -hmm. that we have been able to overcome some of those challenges, and maybe even before coming to Transformers, we've now received a very, uh, at least a sizable consignment of meters, and I'm committing to the public, but come, come the new year, mm -hmm. we do not expect anybody with any pending new connection or replacement of voltmeters. We are on a rapid initiative to clear the entire backlog mm -hmm. of those of the new connections, people who have stayed po for possibly for over a year, for which we sincerely uh, uh, apologize right. for why it took that long. And the same issue also affected transformers where again the company could not procure. Mm -hmm. So what it then had to depend on is what you have just said. Looking for transformers elsewhere and doing some repairs so that it can replace a faulty one in another location of the country. So at right now, as these materials are trickling in, then we would actually be able to surmount that challenge. Uh, Sam. So, so ideally, how long should it take uh, for if a transformer is down or has been stolen or vandalized or whatever, how long should it take to replace that? Yeah, like I mentioned before, what was the main impediment is not the... No, I'm talking about now. Right now, we do not have as yet all the transformers we require. But right, the supplies are now trickling in. And by trickling in, that means the problem is being alleviated with the passage of time. I think we've received a consignment of close to 400. Mm -hmm. So definitely, we'd be able to alleviate that. But what does compound it some again mm -hmm. is that when we have a lot of uh, cases of vandalism, it now makes or worsens our situation. And that's actually why we are appealing to the public. Um, let's work together in this. Okay. We have over 79,000 transformers spread across the entire country. Policing them or other mechanisms, other than really also depending on the goodwill of the public, who are beneficiaries of those services in assisting us, would be a bit insurmountable. So, so but as we work together, right. definitely I do know. That so so tell me, um, because you've been able to monitor the situation of power supply and all these challenges you're talking about. So how many transformers would you need in a month? Right now, we do have a backlog. I mentioned, first of all, for over a year, there are no transformers being procured. What does that mean? There are a number that are required just to replace how many? the ones which are faulty. I may not have the figures right away, but uh, those are things I can, I can get. So that the 400 you say you have in stock, no, they, are, they have just been supplied. up to what? They are still, I mean, the supplies are ongoing. So it's not like this is the end of the supplies. You know what happens is that transformers are items that take some time to manufacture, to test, and to deliver. So when we gave out the orders to the suppliers, they are currently fulfilling those supplies. And we do know that once they are fulfilled all of them, we should be able to deal with the current shortfall. But we are also initiating the process of procuring new ones for the new connections and for the places we expand. Engineer, you're not giving me numbers because I'm asking what is the current gap deficiency? Possibly we could be having a gap of close to possibly around 500. 500? Yes. So then if you have 400 in stock, yes. what should the consumer expect? 
w they should expect that we should be able to surmount that challenge, possibly in the next, uh, in the next three months. Connected to that, there are Kenyans that are asking that um, the cost of connection appears to be different for different consumers at different locations. What is the accurate cost of connection, whether it's for domestic, for industrial, or any other category of customers that you may want to describe? The cost of connection depends on a number of variables, Sam. Mm -hmm. Number one would be how far the, the current service is. Like, the, if you look at how power is, uh, is applied, you have an high tension or a medium voltage, mm -hmm. which is mainly possibly a 11 kV feeder. And then you definitely have to provide a low voltage. So the whole issue is, if it's just a question of one pole from where the transformer is, then that is totally different from a case where you have to extend the medium voltage, possibly by virtue of the distance. So it's a number of factors. One of them is distance. The other one could also be, you may be near, but possibly the transformer that is nearest mm -hmm. is already loaded, is already overloaded. Mm -hmm. So that is to say that you may, it may not be possible to provide you with a service from a particular transformer. So there may be cases really of users or consumers who think and they, they'll tell you that the distance to the nearest transformer is this particular distance. But the challenge there would be possibly that transformer is overloaded. It will also be driven by how much power you require as a consumer. Different consumers, if it's just simple domestic, yep. or if it's industrial, if it's an apartment. So there are a number of factors that come into play. So if you're a consumer, you're within the radius, and you're, you're in Yahuru, for instance, versus someone who is Kamagut, for an, for an example. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so should the price be different, the cost of that connection? If you're within radius, how much should it be? No, it, sh it, it should be, no, I mean, they should almost be the same. If the transformer is not, is not uh, overloaded, then the cost should actually be the same. How much? Somewhere between 60 to 120,000. But again, it depends on a number of factors, really. That is the consumer to pay that? Yes. So what happened to the last mile connectivity? OK, now that is a different issue. Program. When you are now dealing with last mile, mm -hmm. it is the government which has funded that. So those are schemes which are funded by the government. And that is a totally different thing from, from what you have said. When you are footing the bill yourself, then you have to pay for the cost. Okay. But if it's under last mile, it's the government which has actually provided that. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that that one is fully covered. I think the only um, payment that the customer pays is minimal. Though in their bill, maybe mm -hmm. this again is something that the public should know, though in their monthly bill there is a deduction. Okay. So at times um, you may have consumers complaining that I, I paid 500 shillings, and these are the units I'm getting. My neighbor paid this, and these are the units, and there is a disparity. One, if, one, if a customer came through last mile, there is some deduction from what he pays on a monthly basis. So up to what Compared, extent? How much do you want to recover? I think initially, uh -huh. for, the, for the amount to be recovered, there is a deduction. Is it about 50%? OK. So when you pay 100 shillings, part of it goes to, to, for recovery, and the other part goes towards uh, payment of the token. Which is fine. So when do you stop recovering? After how much? I, I do believe it's, uh, is it 15,000? 15, 15,000. Yeah, it could be 15,000, yeah. OK. So what are you doing with illegal connections? What is the status now? That is a very unfortunate uh, situation, um, Sam, that mm. we do have those who really want to use power without paying for it. And, but we are, we are very determined. And I think what I must really appreciate is that we are getting a lot of support now from the public. Mm -hmm. I think we have cases of those who discovered later on that possibly they were actually connected illegally. I want to protect some identities, but I've had people calling me and telling me I've just discovered that I was actually connected illegally. And we normally just do find a way of ensuring that um, they have a safe connection. Because the challenge even of illegal connections, of course there is the issue of revenue that many would look at. But the, the most painful part, Sam, to me, is really the risk that it poses to the public. We have had cases of injuries, cases of even at times electrocution, by virtue of those who are not really qualified, right. cutting shortcuts, providing illegal connections, injuring people. And when these injuries do occur, Sam, the first person they think is a criminal is myself. Little do they know at times that some of them 
were really undertaken by people who are not qualified. Okay. They are trying to cut shots, uh, to cut shortcuts. At times, they use materials which are not of the required quality. But we are, first of all, are very determined to stem that one out. And the first place... So, so yes. t t tell me, out of the entire consumption, what percentage is going to illegal connections? Uh, it could just be somewhere around 2%. 2%? At, at most. And what are you doing with it? We have, we have a number of fronts. And this is um, one of them. Let me, let me just answer in the first instance. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really fueled a lot of illegal connections is the challenge that I've just alluded to you a short while ago. Mm -hmm. The challenge that there was a time there were meters were not available. Indeed, until just the other day, mm -hmm. there were no meters in the country. Mm -hmm. So what would then happen, especially under the last mile scheme, power is provided to somebody's doorstep, but there is no meter. After a short while, this guy comes along, Sam, and tells you, why should you suffer? Why don't I assist you? Just give me 500 shillings or 1,000, and I connect you directly. So what really fueled that rise mm. in terms of illegal, or rather those are more of direct tappings, because at times those are done well, but now they are directly connected, was the lack of meters. And okay. that is a challenge we have already overcome. There are a number of um, mechanisms we want to work together with the government in terms of especially supplying power to the informal settlements. In the informal settlements are patriotic Kenyans. Mm. Many of them are patriotic Kenyans. Mm -hmm. But at times you only need one or two errand guys to cause a lot of disruption to what would have otherwise been a very organized um, environment. And we are engaging, in fact we did send an expression of interest, to see how we can partner with the good the goodwill okay. to supply power in the informal settlements. Number one, like I said again, our primary drive is the safety perspective. But even as we deal with the safety, ensuring that the connections are all safe, we also do know that we are going to stem the issue of illegal connections, which again are done in a substandard way and actually pose a very big risk to the public. But we are working together with the government and working together with all men of goodwill to ensure that we stem this vice. Okay. But yes. I'm, I'm asking that question because in January this year, President William Ruto spoke to Kenya Power and told them that um, if you find a citizen has been connected to electricity by whatever means, go and put a meter and begin to charge them. Don't switch off a whole estate. I don't know whether there's any compliance to that, but also what it means, especially for business continuity of Kenya Power. No, I think the message from the president was really very clear. And this is dealing with a category like I mentioned before, mm -hmm. where we have situations where the connection was done well, mm -hmm. but by virtue of lack of a meter, the, there was a direct connection. So that meant, in terms of safety, mm -hmm. the installation is okay. So it's not posing any risk to the public. Okay. But we have an issue where now this person has directly connected. Mm -hmm. So instead of dealing with him in a very adverse manner, the whole issue is just install a meter, and uh, start getting revenue out of it. So we do appreciate the fact that during this period when there are no meters, there are a number that fall in that category. But definitely, it would not be the case, like one which I, again, don't want to possibly to, prote to protect the identity of the individual. Mm. We had an issue of an underground cable which was running for a kilometer from a transformer. That one is quite risky. It's so quite risky. what did you do Apparently, in that particular of case? Of course, we had to recover it. We had to remove it. We had to remove Any it. Any prosecution? So, let me, let, let, let me not go further than that. But yes, there was a prosecution. But again, let me protect the identity of the individual. You're not speaking about the identity of the individual. I'm just asking. <laughs> yes, there was, there was a prosecution. There was and a prosecution. what is the outcome of that? I may want to go back to find the update, but yes, there was a prosecution. I know the case proceeded, but I do not know how it... Or the reason I'm asking this um, engineer is because there are Kenyans who are connected to meters and they're having to pay for Kenyans who are not paying, but they're using the power. And so when you say, even if the president directs and says that if there is an illegal connection, go meet it, uh, there are persons that uh, have done the ir illegal connection, you remove the cable and that's it. I mean, so for how long are Kenyans, the rest of Kenyans who are doing the right thing going to pay for it? No, there was a prosecution. There was actually a prosecution. It's in public domain. But again, let me not talk about the identity of the individual. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. But yes, like um, maybe just to give the comfort to the Kenyans, mm. by virtue of the fact that we received a consignment of 320,000 meters, by today, I think we have hit 100,000. Over the last six weeks alone, mm -hmm. over the last six weeks, we have installed 100,000 meters to consumers, some of whom had been waiting for over a year, 
some possibly close to two years. But we are done with 100,000, and we are determined that in the next close to two months, or rather by the end of December, we'll have cleared the entire backlog. Okay. Right. And in so doing, mm. some of them could have been directly connected. So what does that mean then? That all of them have now come into the arena of actually paying for the electricity. Okay. For the illegal connections, let's work together. And indeed, the media will really play a very big role in assisting us in this fight. So you have a part, Sam, Sam <laughs> to, to, play, <laughs> to, to play in this fight. I hear you. But let me take you back to towards the end of August um, this year. There was a national power outage or blackout, if you like. And first of all, at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, so power was out, action was taken on people who manage the Kenya Ports Authority. No responsibility has been taken by the Kenya Power, who in the first place are supposed to be supplying the power. So what happens that you have such a key installation and it goes out of power? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. And let me, let me just go back to the way I think you had, asked, you had wanted to ask a question that maybe let me answer it now that uh, mm -hmm. you've not come back to it. When we talk about how power um, is evacuated, transmitted, and supplied, first of all, there are those who generate power. And in the arena of power generation, uh, the big boys like Kenjan, then you have the IPPs. After power is generated, and ordinarily power is generated at a slightly lower voltage, mm -hmm. possibly 3,000 volts. And it immediately has to be taken very high. And the reason is simple, sir, maybe for the listening public. The higher the voltage, normally the power that is transmitted is a product of voltage and current. When the current is high, the losses are higher. Mm -hmm. Now, what then happens is that if you are able to raise the voltage so high, then for the same power, you can reduce the current by the same margin. If you raise the voltage by four times, of course, the current, you can re for the same power. So then you have a situation where after generation, of course, it is... Uh, there is, um, I mean, the voltage is raised very high. It's transformed to a very high voltage. And then you move using these lines that we are showing on your screen mm -hmm. to where they are required. And then again, you transform it. You bring the voltage lower. And of course, you now distribute. So whenever you have a disturbance, the disturbance could be coming from any part of that network. It can be coming from generation. Mm -hmm. It could be coming from transmission. It would be coming from uh, distribution. The one at distribution level would only affect a localized group who are served by that uh, distribution area. But at generation, it may now mean that it will affect a wider, a wider area. Mm -hmm. In a case, possibly again explaining, ordinarily for power to be stable, there are two things that you monitor in any power system. You monitor the voltage and the frequency. Those are the two key parameters that are always monitored. Mm -hmm. The frequency in Kenya across all voltages is 50 hertz. That is 50 cycles per, per second. Now, what does happen is this um, sum. Whenever, like for example, I did mention like the curve that power changes during the day. Mm -hmm. When you read the evening, for example, the demand starts going up. Now, what does the dispatcher have to do? When the demand goes up, you have to bring in more generation to bridge that gap. Otherwise, if you don't, the voltage, the, the frequency is going to drop. And if you are not careful, you can actually lose the network. So it's a very delicate balance. It's not just a question of switching on and switching off. Mm -hmm. And that's actually why at times when I feel people really blaming the, my team at National Control, I feel bad in the sense that these are the real patriots who should be possibly awarded the honors of, I don't know which honors they should be given. Mm -hmm. But the issue is they really have to do a balancing act. Now, there is an aspect that I would like to mention to the listening public. We do have what is called spinning reserves. What we mean by spinning reserves, uh, Sam, mm -hmm. is that you have some generation which are generating, not at maximum, they are generating, if it's rated, for example, at 100 megawatts, you start generating it at 70. And these ones are waiting, and especially because of the, what is called the variable energy resources. Mm. I think you do remember about the wind and solar. Right. The reason why these ones always have to be on, wind can go down or up any instance without warning. And if you don't mitigate, if it goes down, something else must come up to meet that, de to break that demand. If it goes up, then this other one must come down. So what happened August 25th, 26th? August, there is a generation plant which we lost 270 megawatts. 
Ordinarily, when you have a spinning reserve, the margins are not of that magnitude. Mm -hmm. And this is a time, again, when hydrology was not very good. Mm -hmm. What I mean by hydrology is that the dams were not, the dams are normally, they play a very big role in stabilizing the grid. When you are generating from a sinker and all these dams, Tarquel, Kiampera, and all of them, they were not when available they, on this night? No, they were supplying, but by virtue of the level of the water, they were not really supplied as much power to the grid. So you have a situation where the proportion of what can vary is a bit, is a bit high. And once you lost the 270 megawatts, and at the time we were generating, or rather the demand was 1,850. So from 1850, the moment you lose 270 megawatts, the system was unable to respond quick enough to, 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 to recover the system. So, and that's actually why it cascaded and failed. So, so why did you lose the 270? There are things called a trip. And I think you even know at times, even in your house, at times as a circuit breaker can just trip. At times, some of the trips could be by virtue of a real, a true fault, or at times an equipment could misbehave and it trips because it is... So on this particular day, what caused the trip? The plant seemed to have seen a condition on the network that indicated there was an issue. So to protect itself, of course, it tripped. But as to whether that condition really existed, that is an issue that we have, we have been unable to trace where such a condition existed. But yes, the plant did trip, and we lost 270 megawatts. The moment we lost the 270 megawatts, the rest of the generation were not quick enough to rise up to bridge that gap. So how often does that happen? In terms of trips? Yeah. Trips are so frequent. So why was, was this time it's such, a, big, it's the such a big challenge? It's the magnitude. The magnitude. When you lose the other trips, I did mention about spinning reserves. If you lose 50 megawatts, it's not going to affect anybody. You may just see a slight dimming, and the others just rev up to, to occupy that space. But if you lose a very big plant, at times it is, it's, it's a challenge. So what is the status of those in, that investigation? I, th I do believe the investigation was, um, was undertaken, it was closed, and then there were, of course, certain settings where they were also done to enhance the security of the system. What I mean, and possibly just to, for full disclosure, one of the things that does happen is that you can set the plant on how long it should respond to a situation. So we just expanded the duration it should wait before giving up. Okay. on the network so, so that it attempts to support the network. It doesn't give up so quickly because at times, at times it could just be a very small issue mm -hmm. and if it just held a bit longer, the network would have remained. So we did a number of settings. We mm -hmm. did uh, a number of settings in the network. Engineer, you don't realize that can be a very technical area that you're getting into. <laughs> I'm just hoping that our viewers are able to understand that. But let's take a look at the feedback that has also been coming from um, Kenyans, Brian, Kenya, you're saying that uh, is the upcoming El Nino a threat to our supply, and why does this happen every time it rains? So, what is the relationship between rain and power outage? You know, rain does a number of things. Of course, there is the aspect. I don't want to say the aspect of lightning because that could be one of the other factors. Mm -hmm. But at times, in certain installations, like we depend, for example, on poles and. Um, even the pylons that you are seeing on the screen. Mm -hmm. And we have a situation at times where when there are heavy rains, some of them are actually washed away or it compromises. And I do know there are parts of the country where the soils are not as stable. So whenever there are heavy rains and there are floods, mm -hmm. then you have a situation, a situation where it can actually, it can wash some of the infrastructure and thus requiring very uh, immediate response. Another one at times is that again, when it rains very heavily, it can cause some trees to fall on the line. And of course, the moment it falls on the line, it causes a, a short circuit and uh, causes a disturbance on the network. So there are a number of things that actually the rains do uh, foster and thus posing that particular challenge. But, but it's, it's, it's almost uh, predictable in several parts of the country that uh, once it starts to rain, then they're going to lose power. Mm -hmm. Is it that there is always a pole getting washed away? Are we then uh, doing the implantation the wrong way? No, uh, like, <laughs> like I said, the, the level, the strength of the soils in different parts of the network are different. Additionally, when it rains so heavily such that it's almost pouring, mm -hmm. Then you have a situation where 
if it's pouring and it's pouring across conductors of different faces, then of course it's going to cause a shot. I don't know if you get me. Get like if you, if you power water or if you touch water. Mm. So that, those could be other complications where as the, the downpour is really, especially when it is quite intense, it can cause a lot of, uh, it can cause a situation like that one. Another one, uh, Sam, is that some of the rains are at times accompanied by very strong winds. And these winds, of course, has an effect on the, on the conductors. Okay. At times it swings them and possibly the conductor swings and touches a, a pole or it touches a tree or they touch one another and okay. they, they cause that kind of a disturbance. Yeah. Okay, engineer, I'm sure you've heard of the joke that uh, when it starts to rain, <laughs> okay. But let's take a look at uh, more feedback coming to us um, on different platforms. Len Chassie, you're saying that uh, when will Kenya achieve 95% power coverage? I am almost retiring, still looking forward to getting connected to the grid at my rural home. It's quite frustrating, so that's about uh, uh, connectivity. Another one. Sir Nixon Dugira, you're saying that uh, why is there warmer levy in my electricity bill and who ends up with it, taking into consideration what is a natural resource given by God and flowing freely? Um, then Eric, Co. Eric, please ask the CEO why new electricity connection is very much expensive. I was given a quotation of 1 million shillings in an, in an area that requires three poles based on the contractor's assessment. I think we can respond to those first, especially the person who is asking about 95% uh, coverage uh, with power. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sam. I think that is a very genuine and a very good question. And let me just really appreciate mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, what the government is doing, especially on the last mile. Like I said, Sam, 2013, we were just at 2 million. Today, we are at 9.2 million. Mm -hmm. There are a number of tenders running right now for last mile. And the government is really keen on ensuring the electricity penetration, which currently starts at 76%, 70, mm -hmm. it really goes to 100% by the year 2030. So there is, there is a lot of commitment from the government side in terms of realizing that. Right. But I think what is also important for the public to know is that it is capital intensive. And indeed, one of the reasons which attributes even to the cost of power is really the capital that the government has invested over the last 10 years. There has been massive, massive investment in generation, in transmission, and in distribution. But the beauty, and this is really what I want to assure also the members of the public, mm -hmm. when you look at some of those investments, they are long term. Let me just cite one of them. The Ethiopia Kenya line, which links a place called Walaita Sodo and Suswa, is a line that can carry 2,000 megawatts. But right now, it's only carrying 200. So what does that tell you? That that is an investment which we will continue to benefit from 30, maybe even 40 years from now, mm -hmm. without really exhausting its capacity. So yes, the investment is as, as being invested, and that investment is long term. Okay. It's not investing for the short term. So definitely in terms of what the government is doing, there is a lot of investment in last mile okay. to ensure that we really expand and cover all this. Co connect that with the, the viewer who is saying that uh, they were asked for 1 million shillings to connect, yet you gave me a figure of between 16 and 120,000. Why, why that disparity? No, the issue would be if a transformer. You know, it all depends on what is required to serve that particular customer. Where definitely you need a transformer to serve him, definitely the cost is high. And let me... Is he supposed to buy a transformer for himself? The whole issue would be, yeah, if, if I mean, if it's the one, like, yeah, for situations where none is existing, then, of course, he has to, to pay for that. Unless they're in a community of a group, in which case that, that cost can be shared amongst the beneficiaries. But where you, as an individual, would require to have a transformer, then, of course, that, is, that would be actually quite costly. Even domestic? Yeah, even domestic, yes. Wow. Warma components in the water bill? Warma is for water resources. And these are mainly, we pay it for the hydros. I do believe. I may not have a, a very clear brief, but I do believe there are a number of things that Warma also does in guarding our water towers. Hmm. And so they feel that the power that is generated from, um, from electricity, especially from the dams, right. there is some little money they should actually contribute for the maintenance of these water towers. 
Tell me, um, you've come in as a CEO after, I mean, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. You're succeeding your six predecessors, none of whom uh, has left with quite a good name. Um, some of them have been forced to leave or take leave. Well, I didn't plan that. But um, so here you are. And just last year, I think it was January 2022 when there was that power outage, that major power outage. And there are some officials that were taken to court, uh, to court on economic uh, terrorism charges. Well, never mind that they were uh, cleared later on. What is the state of Kenya power at the moment, and especially the corporate governance, um, the transparency in terms of how you're doing your work and what has changed five months in? Yeah, let me assure the public that Kenya power is a bit, and there is a lot of energy. If you look, I did mention about the issue of the meters. If you look at how long it has taken for 100,000 meters to be installed, Sam, the level of enthusiasm in the company is at an all-time high. If you look at the board, excellent people. They are really doing a very good job. We have, looking at the government, the ministry level, we have professionals. And the kind of support and the kind of system that, that we have as an energy sector is so conducive. And indeed, let me assure the public that even as the energy sector, we are really working together so closely. And the, what transpired last year, which was most unfortunate, because the people who are taken to court were our colleagues. These are professionals. Indeed, I do remember I had actually been called. I was one of the state witnesses. And testifying before the magistrate, I was very clear that the same people who are before the court are the same ones who are assisting to mitigate a situation in Longonot. There were some collapse towers in Longonot. And over the Christmas period, Sam, they were very patriotic enough not to visit their families. They spent most of the nights and days in Lokonot trying to bring up, use a temporary restoration towers or rather uh, poles to restore the Loengalani Suswa line. Mm. And after they did it, it was most unfortunate that a narrative was just spanned that these are saboteurs, which was most, most unfortunate. And I really do believe that that is never going to happen again in this country, where those who should really be rewarded for being patriots are being punished or being um, branded mm. as economic support to us. That, is, that was most unfortunate. But right now, and I think the entire workforce in Kenya Power are so sure that for as long as they are doing that which is right, they have no one to fear. Is there any, it, is, is it, there any corruption at uh, Kenya Power at the moment? I would be sure that over 95, 96%, there may be a few elements, Sam. You can never miss them. Mm. When you have a workforce of about 11,000, you are not going to miss a few, but we are so determined. And in fact, one of the key addresses that I do address my staff, first of all, is to uphold integrity. That for as long as they do that which is right, and I even want the Kenyan public to know this, mm -hmm. for as long as they do that which is right, for as long as they uphold their integrity, they will never be put to pressure to do that which is wrong. It will never come from my office, and I will never facilitate any. Okay. And all of them already know that. That, and, uh, but we do know, we are working with security agencies and all the other agencies, arms of the government, to weed out if there are one or two who are not, um, I mean, doing their role, they are not going to last there for so long. In fact, the, the, the thoughts, or even as I talk to them, Sam, one of the things that I do tell them is that I, am not, I have no intention to see anyone suffer. But if it is such that they cannot toe the line mm -hmm. in as far as doing what is right is concerned, I've welcomed them to come to my office. I can advise them on what, altern what other alternative businesses they can go to do and leave Kenya Power alone. So we are determined to do that which is right. We are determined to restore the glory of Kenya Power. There were days Kenya Power was known as the company of choice, where people would look for employment in Kenya Power. If they failed, then they would look elsewhere. Those days are coming some. Okay. Let's talk this time next year, mm. and you will notice the difference. That so, so, so as you close, uh, talk to me about, because uh, part of the challenges in this country, and especially where the manufacturing industry is not growing as expected, is because of cost of power, uh, whether it's um, petroleum products or it's electricity itself. And a lot of people have been expressing desire to leave, while some have actually left capital flight, if you like. Is there a chance that the costs or the price of power is going to come down. And what are you doing as Kenya Power to encourage 
more manufacturing in the country? Thank you so much, Sam. I think that is really a very pertinent question. What I did mention, like even in terms of the power demand in the country, is that during the day, or during some hours of the day, you have consumption of about 1,200 megawatts. But we are able to supply power all the way to 2,100. Now, we have a situation where to meet the revenue requirements for generation, transmission, and retail is the number of units that is sold. Mm -hmm. Giving the example of last year, we sold about 10,000 gigawatt hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these 10,000 gigawatt hours is what responds to all the requirements of the value chain. Now, if we were able to drive this demand so that instead of 10,000, you would have, say, 15,000, that would then mean mm -hmm. 15,000 gigawatt hours would be answering to revenue requirements that would have otherwise been answered by 10. And that would mean actually you can save possibly 30%. So that is one of the areas where we are trying to spur demand. And indeed, in uh, talking about demand, we did introduce the time of use tariff. And the purpose of the time of use tariff, and indeed we want to encourage industry to take advantage of it, is that from around 11 p.m. up to 6 a.m. in the morning, they can enjoy half the normal rate. And so if the industry can really take advantage of this time of use tariff, mm. then definitely that is going to change the landscape because they are then going to enjoy half, half the rate. And then again, like I did mention, we have interconnections with our neighboring countries. And in, these interconnections are really to facilitate a higher uptake of power. Okay. We have even very good tariffs for e-mobility. So if they can take advantage and import e-vehicles, um, e that e-cooking and a number of these initiatives which enjoy special tariffs are all available for them to harness. But more importantly for the industry, there is the time of use tariff. And even going forward, if you look even at the tariff that was uh, approved by the regulator, Sam, it's reducing year by year. The, the tariff for this year is higher than the one for next year. So it's already on a downward trend. You know, I'm just wondering, when you say e-cooking, um, I mean, how different is it from e-freezing when you talk about <laughs> right. the, the fridge at home? Uh, will the household get a different tariff for that? No, really? there is no special tariff for e-cooking. But the, the type of devices that have been brought now that actually use um, uh, e-cooking mm. are, are very efficient. Okay. Yeah, they are actually quite efficient. Mm. And so they can save what they would have otherwise spent in other areas mm. in, this, in that particular space. But for e-mobility, it has a special tariff where if you start charging at night, you enjoy eight shillings per kilowatt hour. So there are definitely a number of things that the industry can take advantage of. All right. I want to take one more um, feedback that has come to us so that we can close with that. And this is uh, Chita Wesley. Why do I have different token units from my friend in the same plot, having bought it for the same amount of money? Maybe you can respond to that and connect that with, you're saying that in 2013 you had 2 million consumers. Now you have 9.2 million, exactly. meaning there's more demand now. Yes. And you're saying that if we increase the demand, the cost of power is going to come down. But you have increased demand to 9.2 million shillings and power has become more expensive. So how sh why should you trust what you're saying? No, the issue is the comparison you've made has not factored in the infrastructure. The infrastructure that was there, indeed the reason why, mm -hmm. possibly the power. And this is the option that the government had to have. One was, do you remain small and maintain the costs at the lower level? And I really loved the title that you gave this uh, explainer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it the costs or is it darkness? So the issue was, in 2013, mm -hmm. do you have most of the country in darkness or do you invest large capital to ensure there is light in a much wider country and indeed it will speak to the gentleman who was asking about 95%, when is it going to reach 95%? Okay. So there is this demand and desire that each and every part of this country is going to be lit. So that infrastructure is already there. But there's still some room to do more infrastructure. But what I meant, Sam, is with the current infrastructure, without adding any other investment, if you can consume more, okay. then the cost is coming down. Okay, yeah. all right. That, that is really the, 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 the question about the tokens. The, the, the question of the tokens mm. is what is his average consumption? Mm -hmm. You know, if you are a customer who consumes zero to 30, then your rate is 12 shillings per kilowatt hour. 
But if your average consumption in three months is 30 to 100, your rate is 16. And that includes if, 31? Yes. And if your consumption is over 100, then you go to the 20 shillings. So that meant when you are buying 500 shillings, but your average consumption is different from somebody else mm -hmm. who is buying for 500 shillings, then of course they are in different categories. And that's why they get different number of units for the same amount. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, all right. I have to thank you, Engineer Sirol, but I am told that there's something we need to look at and ask uh, um, you a question, whether that is you or it's someone else. We'll be getting that. But I have to appreciate your time to be here to really respond to the questions that Kenyans have to ask, but also wish you well as you, you continue with your work. Um, so now, because they are not ready with the picture, I have to ask you an extra question. Um, okay, now it's here. Which, right. Which so do you have the picture? I wish I could describe it for you, but we'll wait for it to, 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 be, to be here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it appears like there's someone standing next to someone who is standing next to someone, and someone is quoting. We just want to establish whether that is you, and it should be here in a short while. Yeah, there it is. Are you in that picture? Actually, it could be my twin brother. <laughs> yeah, I'm the one. That was, I think, maybe the year 1989-90 in Lake Nakuru. 1989, Lake Nakuru. Lake, yeah, that could be Lake Nakuru. When did you meet the president? We were together in college. We used to preach together. You and I still preach. We used to preach together. Oh, you're a preacher? Yep. First and foremost. Which church? But don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you just did. Which church is this? No, no. Invite me anywhere, and I'll, when I'm free, I'll actually come and preach. Ah, OK. Yes, yeah. So you met in college? Yes. Engineer Joseph Sirol, thank you so much for your time. Thank uh, you. To be here to respond to the questions that Kenyans have. And again, all the best in your uh, work. And uh, the explainer takes a short break. We have some more stories to take that is on the business and